There's the editor. How many editors don't relish, yearn for the day that their edition is just full of letters the editor? I mean, if, I mean, in my respect, in my opinion, letters the editor are the lifeblood of a vibrant editorial page. I mean, it shows people are engaged, they're talking about the community, and yet when elections come, it's almost like we sigh and we say, oh my God, it's election season, I have this uptick, this upsurge in letters, and we almost dread the day that we have to have these they come in, we throw in extra guidelines, extra restrictions, and, and for a good reason, because today there's a lot of orchestrated letter writing campaigns. I mean, quite frankly, candidates will look at letters as a way to supplement their advertising budgets. It's a way of supplementing and getting the word out. And so my point is that you want to strike a balance on, I, I firmly believe, get as many readers' voices on that page as possible, and yet, you know, make sure the letters are substantive. Uh, to be certain, you know, you have to really sh wield the sharp editing pencil. The delete button on your uh, keyboard has to be used frequently, and especially as the election winds down, it's close to election day, you should be very comfortable in just really being, uh, being sharp and restrictive on, on editing letters the editor. Um, let me explain, uh, any, any Boy Scouts in the audience? <laughs> let me give you the Boy Scout law. A scout is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, brave, obedient, obedient cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. Do any of those ring a bell and let the other to receive election day? I'm not being, not being, being too facetious, but you get the letter to the editor that says, you can trust candidate A with overseeing the city finances. You'll never find a more hardworking candidate than, than you know, this, this individual. My candidate is loyal to her family, loyal to her business. She'll bring that same approach to the school board. What you want to do is, you know, it, it, it's not so far-fetched that you see these themes used over and over and over in letters. And you're going to get those, but you also want to have substantive letters. We're going to walk through, and, and actually I'd like to just walk through on, uh, on your handout, there's a, a checklist, but you talk about you know, being wary of the uh, orchestrated campaigns, have some criteria, uh, address 11 hour exchanges, but I'd like to, I, there has to be questions out there of challenges you face in letters the editor. If not, we'll just kind of walk, we'll go through the handout on page two and start walking through just some of the points that I think you should keep in mind as you go through election season. But anybody at all on headaches that you face in letters the other during election season? Yes? What about editing letters to the editor? What, what's your feeling on somebody comes along with a big old long letter and it's, it rambles and maybe you want to edit it for brevity. Should you edit it or should you send it back to them and say, Edit it. How many uh, folks here have have restriction or the word count for letters the editor? Do you have a different one during election season, or is it the same? Same. It's be my, my point, first of all, is you should have you should have a, a letter length. I've seen letter lengths from in, in metro papers, 150 words. Some people go up to 400 words, but have a letter length. So first of all, if that letter comes in, and if it's longer. I mean, you, it has to be edited, but even the, uh, if a letter which comes in and abide by that length, look at it closely. And if it's just repetitive, I mean, it's amazing if you take a letter to the editor from somebody, they think every word is, is perfect and treasured. I mean, I can tell you, when I wrote editorials or stories and sent it on to someone else to edit, I thought, my God, how can they find 25, 30 words, 50 words, 100 words to edit out of that? You can edit that letter without them even knowing that you made a difference. But if you have to uh, substantially edit it, I would give it back to them and say, you know, tell them and say, you know, you can have the first crack at it if you want, else bring it back, you know, else you'll do it. And I think depending on how, I would, if you edit a letter, I mean, I think everybody should understand that letters are up for editing. You know, you re reach that conflict because they say, well, the letters page is my page and you can't touch anything I send into it. But you should feel comfortable in editing and I certainly would not you know, if you edit a letter, I would not send it back to them and say, how is this? I mean, if you're just doing straight, routine editing, cutting out you know, duplicity, redundancies, you know, fixing grammar, you know, but if you're substantially changing it, I mean, if someone turns in a 500-word letter to the editor and you're paring it down to 250, you know, you, you probably want them, you know, give them the chance to look at it. Well, let's just go down the checklist here, and if other questions come, we'll go, but, we, I mean, we'll throw them in, but, Deadlines for, for election letters the editor. 
How many have a, I mean, I strongly recommend you should have two sets of deadlines. What, what do you think I'm driving at? Right. One, one uh, deadline for just any election letter as the editor. That might be, you know, depending if you're non-daily or daily, I mean, I, you know, it's going to vary. But have one uh, deadline for elections the editor, and you want to keep that, you know, as close as you can to election day for, you, for that final edition, but also recognizing if you get a big up, upsurge, you've got to have the space to accommodate them. Then you should have a second deadline, an earlier deadline, you know, it can be in the daily, might be three, four days before, and a week, you know, weekly or, you know, twice weekly, it might be a week before, but for raising new issues. So if somebody brings in a, a letter to the editor and it really warrants a response from the opponent, you should give that opponent the opportunity to respond. They may choose not to, but you should have it in the newspaper early enough so if they want to respond, they can. Do people do that? Do, do, I think it's a good thing to think about because that way it prevents that 11th hour, you know, that 11th hour letter. And as you, as you on that same topic, 11th hour letter is the editor. How many of you had a letter which has come in, I mean, at the very end and raising some new issue in the campaign? Or anything that's ever just comes out of the left field? You know, you, you often get those. I think you should look at those 11th hour letters the editor in two, in two different ways. I mean, it may come in, it, it may, you know, they've missed the deadline for raising new issues. But it honestly, I mean, if they've missed that, you look at it two ways. If it's an issue which is out there, you know it's been out there, you've even heard it rumbling, and they're trying to do the last minute salvo, I think you just politely reject it and say, you missed the deadline. You know, it was there, you missed it. If it's truly a new issue, then I think you can, you can do it two different ways. There might be something which is, uh, it really sheds new light on a race, and, I, and we, we did this once at Red Wing, is that, first of all, consider, does it raise the level of a news story? I mean, if it's really an important issue which has come up at the last minute, and so you do a story on it, and you tell them, well, we won't do a letter, we'll incorporate in the story, and then you will contact the, 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 the opposing candidate and you know, do a news story on it. Or, if you think it's a, you know, when leave it as a letter, and again, it's missed the deadline, but you think it, it's worthy, what we did once is we called the opponent and we said, we, we got this letter and we are, we are making an exception here because this is something which truly just surfaced and do you want to respond to it? And then we ran it on the last, you know, the last page, the last edition before the election with an editor's note that says this, you know, came in late, we thought it was worthwhile, and then run them side by side. But that way you, if, you know, that's just, you know, you really do that on a case by case basis if it's really something that, uh, that you think rises to that level. In terms of letter deadlines, how many of you uh, publish, I mean, do you, do you put a notice in the paper saying these are our deadlines for election letters? I would, if you don't, I would encourage you to not do it once, not do it twice, not do it three times, do it about 10 times, and write a column on it. And write a column saying these are the ground rules, and you'll see the packet uh, in the, the end, there's a column I wrote in letters, the editor, but write a column, explain the ground rules for letters, and put the deadlines in. You will find people who will find every way, shape, and form that will come in and say, you know, I mean, we would have a deadline, and we say, you know, it's five o'clock, November 1st, or whatever. And I'm not kidding, I mean, it happened every single year. Somebody, we would, you know, the door would, I'd walk out the office at five, five after five, and the doors were locked. Somebody knocked on the door and said, hey, can I bring my letter in? And it happened to be somebody who was actively and politically involved for 25 years. And, you know, my point is, if you have done due diligence on publicizing and announcing that deadline, had another person, I mean, it was, it, we've all had, we had our local letter writing uh, campaign, uh, letter writing machine, and got a letter, I mean, faxes, I don't know how many people use faxes today, because it's, uh, it's typically, you know, emails now, we're bringing in, but we had the deadline, four o'clock on whatever day, and it came in, and on our fax machine, is at 4.04. And I called up the dick, I said, this isn't gonna run. And he said, well, you know, it's 359 here or something. I said, you know, your, your clock is off. I said, Dick, here's another one. He was a local county uh, uh, chair and, and for 25 years. And I said, you know, he said, well, and he got mad. He said, well, it's my, you know, I've got to get out of my staff because they sent it in late. And I said, well, it's not going to get in. I mean, again, we publicized those, you know, those deadlines for eight weeks ahead of time. So I think you can just be very uh, restrictive and, and just, you know, have your rules and stick to them. Um, on the, um, 
Letters the editor, do you ever get a letter from somebody who uh, is responding to an ad? Maybe you haven't, but I think that as you look at letters the editor, kind of put the, the, keep it on a level, level playing field. If somebody is writing a letter in response to another letter, you know, that's all appropriate if they're responding to a new story, you know, that, you know, that's something. But we have some instances where a candidate, you know, we have one campaign very aggressive and running a series of, series of uh, pretty aggressive attack ads, and the other candidate wrote in a, wrote in a letter and was, and was uh, you know, saying, well, it's not true, and, and, and I think, again, these are, you know, points for kind of brainstorming, for discussion to think about, but I think you have to, on that one, if somebody literally is doing an ad campaign and you're getting revenue from it, and somebody has to respond to it, it's quote, the free letter of the editor. I mean, it depends what it is. If it's a one-time shot and they're saying it's unfair or whatever, but if they start bringing it in on a regular basis or something, responding to every ad with a letter, you know, I, th I think you have to say, hey, that was an ad campaign. You know, we'll direct you to our advertising department and let them help, let them walk you through this. Um, letters the editor, the way they're displayed, you know, think carefully and how you have them on your page. I had uh, another, uh, uh, campaign worker, volunteer, call in and complain that the letter to the editor on the editorial page for their opponent had, was top of the page, you know, five column, four column headline, and their letter to the editor for their, for their candidate was at the bottom of the page with a two, you know, a, a two column headline. Well, the letter to the top of the page was 15 inches long, the letter to the bottom of the page was two inches long. So try to explain it in terms of basic layout and, and you know, as you're designing a page, just like a, a story, you know, you aren't gonna have a new story in, that's two inches long on the top of page one unless you box it, it's a special thing. I mean, that's just the basic designs of layout. But it's amazing how, as they are caught up and watching their campaigns, just how they watch every single thing you do. So I think you have to be prepared. And as I talk about yesterday and today about how there's so many opportunities for writing columns, explaining to readers, Letters the editor, you, can, you might have two or three times throughout the season that you can really write a letter, or write a column and explain to people. Um, let's go on another. The, uh, how many, maybe, maybe you know, how many of you allow letters the editor from candidates, not in response to something, but just a letter? I mean, just say, laying out their campaign. Anybody? I, I applaud that. I mean, I, I, I've seen more, I, I'm actually a, a very, rather large paper uh, close to Red Wing, they would allow every candidate to have one letter outlining their campaign. And I guess it always, it always surprised me because if you're doing your job in news coverage, if you're doing your profile, if you're doing your Q and A's, I don't think they need an opportunity then to write, and these were about 25, 30 inch letters the other where they really were writing their campaign platform. So again, yes. At what point do they become a candidate, though? I mean, I have uh, three that uh, said they're going to file for state rep, and they ask, all three of them have asked me if they can submit letters to the editor. At the time that they file, then they are a candidate, and I would, should not accept any letters to the editor? Well, the, basically, I, I agree with, yeah. I mean, my point was this is, I should explain on this one, this is a newspaper that did very thorough coverage of elections, very thorough coverage of campaigns, and this was two weeks before the election, and they just routinely gave everybody an opportunity to write their campaign, their campaign speech in the paper. And I just, I thought, it's a waste of space, and if they want to do an ad outlining their, their uh, platform, do that, but if you're really doing your job, and, and this paper had nothing to, they should not have felt poorly about short-shifting coverage. They were very thorough in their coverage. Letters the editor that, how many of you charge for letters the editor? Any, yes. What's, uh, what are your guidelines, your rules? I or? did one time last election campaign because it was a letter to the editor that came in at the 11th hour and it was from a former mayor endorsing one of the mayor world candidates and it, some, some of the things in the letter did not give the other two candidates time for rebuttal mm -hmm. and I, I said, I cannot run this as a letter to the editor, and he, he was very insistent on getting it in, and I said, well, I can, you can pay for it, you can buy an ad. And so we kind of went through and re, I re reworded it with him, 
to make it an advertisement and paid mm -hmm. for by his name on the bottom of it and everything. So, and that's and and it's other when you raise that when they did as an ad, that's also something that you should have the discussion on. That is that you know. I mean, you, you do that way, but is it fair play? Is it is if somebody brings it in, you, you reject it as a letter, you let them put it as an ad, and the opponent doesn't have a chance to respond. I mean, you have to look at the circumstance. If it's just kind of an ongoing series of, of, of campaign ads, but if it's something truly, you know, I mean, you might even, as that came in, I would have even looked at, I mean, does it, like I say, rise even to the, to the level of a, of, a, of a story that you pursue? But, but uh, my, also my other point on paid letters is you'll see that you all get, you know, kind of back to my Boy Scout law of hardworking, trustworthy, loyal, the heart, and that the, the letters the editor that really come in, they're just the same old, I mean, I can tell you, I had in my drawer, I could pull it out, and every year, every two years in city council elections, I had the same six individuals write letters for the same people, and with the same themes, and I think that uh, you'll see some newspapers that will on those if they're just kind of the, those types of, you know, I mean, they're endorsed, the obligatory endorsement letter, which is really not raising any issues, not bringing any substance of the campaign debate, is that they charge for them. I've never been a, a firm believer. I've, I've never believed in charging, but I, I think that uh, that is something that you're seeing more and more. I would, uh, I guess, uh, one thing I would recommend or suggest that if you get those uh, letters, especially as you get toward the end of the campaign, and you have local races, and if you get like you know, 10, 12, or six letters, all for candidates, with similar themes about that candidate, think about design, and think about how to display. What we would routinely do is if we had uh, maybe two people running, uh, I mean, for a city council race, and we had 10 letters stacked up, trying to get, we're a daily, but still, they, they bottle up, they were coming in, is that we would do a you know, large headline across the top that says, candidate supports downtown development. And then we would take the, the letters beneath it, and we would just have one column short subhead on each one, and really, really, really edit them down to, sometimes they were you know, 35, 40 words. And then, so the most important thing, I think, for candidates, they want to show the community who's supporting them, is the, the name, the author, who, who are their supporters. And so we would do that display, maybe run a mugshot or something just to break it up. I mean, it may have been a, you know, 20 inches of letters, it could have been 30, 30 inches, depending how many. Also, I would uh, encourage that if you have letters, uh, especially if you're non-daily, and if you have a block of letters on uh, supporting you know, candidate A and B, I mean, the opponents in the same race, try and run those letters in the same edition. I mean, if you can, so people just have a, a can size up next to, side by side on, on the issues and uh, who's, who their supporters are. Um, how many get the letters, the editor, that you say, uh, or, or somebody's challenged you and said, I just read the letter in the paper, and you know, that's the uh, campaign chairman for the candidate. You should really identify in that letter who, who the author is. Maybe you haven't had as many issues with the letters that we had, but I, one thing is identifying the authors. I do think it's, a, it's worthwhile and appropriate that if you have a letter to the editor, say a school referendum, and there's somebody writing about the finances, why that means the taxpayers, and if it's, the, if it's the business manager of the school district, I think it's perfectly, you know, it's, it's valuable so people see that this is somebody who has some knowledge and special perspective of that issue. But we also will receive people who complain and say, well, you know, that's, I mean, literally, that's the sister-in-law of the candidate. Well, in a small community, there's probably a good chance that a fair share of the letters that are written, people are related to each other. There's no way in heck that I'm gonna try, that I'm gonna know all the relationships or that we should even, we should even identify that. I mean, there's, you know, there's friends, there's neighbors, there's family members. Yes? A subject that no one, I don't think, has brought up. What if at 11th hour you get a letter and you can't put it on the press, on the printed edition, but it could make your website? Will anybody be willing to do that? How many people, with your, I mean, are your letters, do you put them on, in the print and on the web? Do you? Yeah. Same, I mean, do you ever, I mean, what one, one suggestion I've heard from some is when you get all these kind of obligatory three-sentence letters that they're loyal and hardworking, that you kind of put those letters on the web page and put the more substantive letters in your print edition. But I think the web edition, I mean, I think that I, I, I would see no reason not to put that there if you're, if you're actively promoting the web and people know to look to there. I mean, be ideally, if you, I mean, were you able to, in the print edition, say, look to the web for this letter or 
they would have, or you were already depressed. It hasn't actually happened okay. yet. I'm just thinking, what if? You yeah. know, I didn't know whether anybody had had that kind of. I think you have, to, I mean, again, you have to be careful. If you, if you publish your deadlines really ahead of time and have told people the 11th hour, and I think that you're on firm ground in rejecting, I think you have to have some extenuating circumstances for putting in that letter at the end. Anybody else? Well, just a couple other points, and we'll wrap up so we go to the last session. But um, the other, um, let me do, you know, be aware to make the person, we all know that there are orchestrated campaigns. Um, and, but, you know, I, we had the individual who walked in and literally dropped off six letters. So here are the six letters, you know, and all for this candidate. I know, and he knows that, uh, you know, I mean, he, you know, somebody in the campaign office wrote them all and he dropped them off, and I just rejected it to take them back. Now, I know they're going to come back two days later. And then the, the, the individual person will bring it in, but at least I'm going to make sure that they take, they have to put a little extra effort, and they have to walk in and at least bring it down to the newspaper themselves or throw in the mailbox themselves or write their own email. But I, you know, we know that the letters are, are orchestrated, and, um, and, and I think the, still the point is the orchestrated ones typically are you can pare them down. I mean, you can really, really take it down the nuts and bolts of the issue and then go ahead and, and present them. Don't be afraid to call people and to write about orchestrated campaigns. And I'll share one story, uh, and the column is in, your, is in your packet, but it's a nice, nice, tri it's a nice try, but I think it's a nice try, but we're not that stupid. Letter writing campaigns are very much a part of campaign strategies today. Candidacy is a way to supplement paid advertising. Got a letter to the editor, from, I'll give two instances now with, uh, with email, and everything's things so easy, but I got a letter to the editor from, um, from an, from, signed by an individual, I called him up. Do, does everybody here verify letters the editor? I mean, and I would, I would highly encourage that. Again, I mean, I, I've called some, and, and actually one person was almost like in disbelief, and I could tell that somebody else had written, and they were aware they didn't come in, but it's pretty hard. I mean, they did say, yes, it's mine, and, and had to go forward. But I tell you, I called one person, said, I didn't write it, and uh, I, th I think it's the one that I referenced in the column, and he was very upset, very politically active, very strong in, in campaigns. And we were talking, and I knew him, and he said, you know, he said, I got a call from the campaign office, and they said, well, are you willing to write a letter to the editor? And he said, sure. And they said, well, we'll send you some talking points that, you know, that we'd like to have you make. And, and I think it was in a congressional race. And so, uh, of course, lo and behold, is somehow the mis there was miscommunication. They sent the letter straight in with his name. And he said, I'm going to call him up. And he said, I'm not going to write for them anymore. And I'm not, you know, I'm not going to do anything. And so uh, you, know, you can trip up people. And it's pretty red-faced, pretty embarrassing for the campaign. And we wrote about it. We called him on it. I think the other thing is we had, again, this was in a congressional race, and had this nice, long, lengthy letter to the editor in an email. And of course, it, it was all there in, in about six different spots, mind you, in a different font, in capital letters, and maybe even in a different, different color. It said, Goodhue County, Red Wing. So it said, you know, this is all, he will represent Goodhue County, he will stand for Red Wing. I mean, it was a, an email letter, which they had sent to, this, to the, we had about 12 counties in the congressional district. And obviously they sent it around, and, uh, and they just asked people to send it in, but insert your city, insert your county. I mean, I don't even think you have to waste the breath of calling the person saying, not getting in, you just delete it and you know, go forward. And there's enough, there's enough opportunity for people to have substantive exchange on, on the issues and, on, and in the campaign without uh, going through all the, the, the literally the, the garbage that you get. So, you know, I think to, um, any final questions? I'm gonna wrap this up so we get the last session and start on time, but any other challenges, issues, anything that, that comes forward? Yes? I got one more question for you. Uh, I publish a weekly paper that comes out on Tuesdays, which obviously is election day. So you talk about two different deadlines for your letters, uh, one for the accusations and then one for the rebuttals. So if I want to go with that approach, I'm cutting off the accusations in it two weeks ahead of time. Uh, there never has been a real defined policy at this paper. So the last election we had some of those accusation letters come in, and I handled it with, I let it come in the week before because it wasn't defined, mm -hmm. but I gave the candidate a heads up. And I said, you know, this letter's come in, 
you want to take a look at it and if you want to respond, you know, this is really your only chance because next week it's you know election day. So I'm kind of curious how uh, what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, you're right. I mean, you're absolutely correct that in non-dailies, you really have for that new issue, you're pushing it out really, you know, Two, or two weeks before election is early. I mean, that because other things can, can come to service, truly maybe some new issues. And uh, I think that's the, that's the one I explained earlier. We did that when we had, a, even a daily, we had the 11th hour that came in and it did not, it was beyond the deadline. So that's what we did. I think you can look at it two ways. Number one, is it really a news story? I mean, is there something, so you call the candidate and you say, the letter writers, we're gonna do a story on this and call both camps or do as ex exactly as you did, call the candidate and say, hey, you know, it, it missed our deadline, but we're making the decision, we're looking at this objectively, we think it's a worthwhile issue to bring forward, and we're gonna give you the opportunity to respond, so obviously you have to show him or her the letter, they can respond, you put them side by side in the same edition, and then so people know, you know, kind of put the little editor's note in there that says, you know, why you did this. Jim. Uh Greg raised a good point uh, about uh, weeklies and their publication schedules. Uh, I wonder if there's anybody in here that ever varies their publication schedule to accommodate election coverage, mm, if you're a weekly. Yeah. Uh, I know of a paper in uh, Kentucky that uh, goes to press on Tuesday afternoons. They moved up uh, one week to Monday yeah. so that they could uh, get that last batch of election ads and uh, do an editorial about the election. The local clique that was trying to oust the county executive went around and stole most of the papers off the racks. And most of their circulation is by single copy. Uh, just to... I had never heard of them. that. Is a, that is a, a good, a good uh, you know, something to think about of altering it toward the end. Well, let me, a couple final comments. I, and again, you know, I think you should look with election season, you should you know, kind of institute or put in force some, some special guidelines. Uh, and, but it's still, I, I think you can, can do it in concert with, again, giving as many people a voice on your page. I think that you, you, the overriding point is to keep that commentary on a level playing field. You know, inf inform the candidates and the readers. Write a column. Write a column you know, once, twice, three times. Keep it in front of them. Um, but let your readers know that, you, you, again, you welcome that robust exchange of ideas and also be clear that election season you know, necessitates these additional, these special restrictions. Your goal should be to, you know, to give us attention to as many voices as possible, to as many issues as possible. If you achieve that, I really think you're, everybody is benefiting, the candidates, the supporters themselves, their detractors, and most importantly, the voters. So with that, uh, I, I just want to say, I'm shuttling out early tomorrow morning, but I really have enjoyed uh, this workshop. It, it, I might have a passion along with, with Scott, and I mean, it was so pleased to see him do this workshop and I see this many people here who want to do election coverage and find ways to freshen it up and keep it substantive and keep it relevant. And uh, I certainly, uh, my contact information is um, on my handouts, and I did, will never lose my newspaper blood, so I'll, if you ever have a follow-up comment, question, something, feel free to send my way, and I will do my best to respond in a timely manner. Thank you. Thank you, Jim.